Hi, this is Ken McCarthy of Jazz on the Tube, and anybody who's been a regular listener, viewer, follower of Jazz on the Tube knows that we love New Orleans. Okay, we're back uh, with John Swenson, author of New Atlantis, Musicians' Battle for the Survival of New Orleans. And I think an important part of the story, uh, it's a sad part of the story, but it's something that you, it's just it's part of the story and it has to be part of the chronicle, is the very serious uh, losses that took place I mean, so many losses related directly to the levee failures. But then there were a lot of really wonderful young people, you know, leaders, uh, artists, uh, musicians, educators, who were murdered after these levee failures. We could talk maybe about, I think it was Daenerys Shavers who was the first to suffer that fate. We want to talk a little bit about uh, Daenerys' story? Yeah, he was he was leading a group of uh, young musicians, who were teaching them how to be a... One of the things, I, I should back up for a second. One of the things that was missing after the flood was uh, the marching bands, who um, people who like to go to Mardi Gras, that's where they see them most prominently. And uh, the, the, there were far fewer uh, young people, very young, the absence of young people in the media aftermath of the flood was staggering, and it took a very long time for these marching bands to reassemble. And in fact, this is a problem that had been occurring before the flood, and it's a political problem, which is caused by the deprivation of, uh, or the cessation of funds for music education in the uh, school system in New Orleans. Now, I don't know what genius came up with the idea, but uh, in a city that relies as much on uh, culture and, and music history as New Orleans does, the idea of of taking the funds away for the marching bands and to provide instruments for young people whose you know, alternative is to join street gangs, that, that was really stupid. And uh, it's an it's an ongoing thing. The uh, the current governor, Bobby Jindal, is just against all forms of education. It seems, and uh, he's piling on this this uh, problem. And th so this is one of the things that the musicians did do to overcome lack of leadership from all areas of government. Hey, John, uh, do you mind? I don't mean to, I don't mean to interrupt, but one related point I want to make is these marching bands had really have and had really high levels of musicianship and they basically were the farm team uh for the whole New Orleans musical community in other words the the path of development would be as a little kid you follow along <laughs> with the band and just march along and just feel proud just to walk next to the musicians and then of course then that puts the idea in your head wouldn't it be great to be one of the guys playing then the next step is when you're in school, you get your instrument, you go, you get, you become part of the band, you get trained in, in your instrument. The next part of the evolution is uh, you and some friends get together, create your own brass band, and stake out some places in town and play on the street. And if you're good, you survive, and people start uh, asking you to come and play at parties and maybe even some indoor gigs. So these marching bands were really important. And I, and I want to point something out. This is a very, I don't think this is really a well-known fact of jazz history we always hear you know about uh, the great jazz you know our greats and of course one of the greats greatest of the greats was lester young and for some bizarre reason not many people realize lester young got his a big chunk of his musical education in new orleans he lived uh in a, actually there's some debate <laughs> he says he lives in, Al, in algiers or i forget either he says he lives in algiers or, or but maybe he really lived in new orleans but anyway these towns are very close to each other and as a kid uh, if you find some biographical material of him, you will see that as a kid, young Lester Young marched along with these bands, the street bands, not not the school marching bands, but the funeral bands and the parade bands. And that was one of his uh, introductions to the whole world of music. So this street scene, this parade scene, this marching band scene, it's not your, it's not, you know, the marching bands back home, as important as those are. This is a really deep, deep thing. So, sorry, John, go ahead. No, that's, uh, it's it's true that you can, it's very difficult to find a New Orleans musician who didn't have 
uh, a New Orleans jazz musician who didn't have a connection to the marching bands as a child. Uh, so, so these um, some of the musicians took it upon themselves to uh, raise money uh, for the to, to bring to get instruments for these kids and to teach them how to how to play in uh, brass bands and in marching bands and uh, through through help from uh, great charities like the Tipsinis Foundation, a few other really important foundations. Daniel Shavers had a uh, a marching band pretty much ready to uh, perform in their first Mardi Gras when he was killed at the B. Well, I guess it was right at the end of uh, 2006. Uh, yep. So that was a, a great tragedy, and it really rocked the city's music community. Uh, it was one of eight murders that took place. I believe it was eight in the sp- in the space of a week, uh, and. Uh, a few days later, the filmmaker Helen Hill was was also murdered. They both had ties to the Sound Cafe, and the people at the Sound Cafe organized a uh, march on City Hall. Uh, they organized the uh, uh, the group called Silence is Violence. And David Andrews was one of the. He had been also involved in the teaching program at Sound Cafe. And uh, he was one of the spokespersons, and uh, Helen Hill was also one of the spokespeople for uh, Silence is Violence, and they both they played a, a great role in the march on City Hall, which brought a lot of attention uh, to this problem. And I think, while it, you know, you, it couldn't solve the problem immediately, it showed that the people were not going to. The, the citizens of New Orleans were not going to stand back and do nothing while the uh, the mayor and police commissioner refused to pursue these cases. This drama is, was played out uh, very effectively in the second season of uh, the HBO series Treme, which uh, detailed a lot of what we're talking about right now. And particularly the lack of uh, the police, the homicide detectives to bring any of the murder cases to trial. And um, in terms of video, we actually have below links to video of the uh, memorial parade for Helen Hill. We also have uh, some very rough video because I handed the camera to a friend of mine that really wasn't a camera person, but she did shoot. And uh, it's one of the last, if not the last, performances of De Niro Shavers. This was at the Big Nine Social and Pleasure Club. Their big parade, it was their first big parade uh, after coming back uh, at the end of 06. And it was a massive parade of thousands of people in it. And uh, the Hot 8 Band, which was De Niro's uh, band that he played drums for, uh, was one of the bands uh, in that second line. So we have video of that. And of course, we do have video also of Glenn David Andrews' remarks at that Silence is Violence gathering that took place outside of City Hall. So, you know, if, as if it weren't bad enough that the city lost just about everything, all its clubs, all its uh, so many houses, hospitals, stores, uh, traffic lights, uh, electrical lights, sewer, sewer, sewage uh, pipes, water pipes. Yeah, the, the weight of the water sitting, you know, 10, you know, some of these areas had 10 you know, feet of water sitting for a month. And that compressed the soil, which compressed the pipes. I mean, the rebuilding in New Orleans is, is easily one of the most heroic things that ever took place in America. Totally untold story, really. Uh, and that's why we're on, the, we're, we're on this right now. And we're talking specifically about musicians and other artists. You know, as we talk about people like Helen, uh, Helen Hill and uh, the lady at the Sound Cafe. It was really all kinds of artists. And that, that's one of the beautiful things about New Orleans is, is there's a lot of... Um, communication among all artists. It's not, and, and I don't want to take anything away from New York. I grew up in New York. I learned music in New York. It's where I got my education and, and everything. But New York tends to be, you know, you're kind of very focused on your career and your band. And uh, the, the clubs are a little, a little antiseptic. <laughs> you know, white tablecloths, big cover charges often. Very, you know, the sets are by the clock. 
you know, and that's New York. New York's got to be that way. It's, it's that kind of a city. New Orleans is another world. Uh, a lot of communication between the, the different musicians. Uh, it's not unusual for a musician just to wander in off the street and see a buddy playing and shout out. Uh, and then maybe even an invitation. Hey, why don't you come up here and, and join us? You know, that kind of thing. And a lot of collaborations between musical artists, arts in, in other uh, genres. It's a, it's a very, very creative, uh, very human human place. So if you'd like to take a look at the um, De Niro uh, last second line or the Helen Hill Memorial Parade, that, that link will be below. And do remember to come back. Uh, we're talking about John Swenson's book, New Atlantis, very important book uh, for everybody that cares about music and culture and New Orleans and just creativity in general. So uh, if you want to see those videos, just pause and take a look and, and, and come on back. All right, we're back with John Swenson, and we're talking about his book, New Atlantis, Musician's Battle for the Survival of New Orleans, uh, published by Oxford University Press. All praise to Oxford University Press for having the wisdom to uh, put this book out there. Uh, we really, if we care about the music and care about just the creative spirit of human beings and you know, care about New Orleans, we really should support this book in every way we can. Get a copy, tell people about it, a uh, great gift for people that you know love music and love New Orleans and love culture. So we started out by talking about the the essential role that musicians played in um, being the first, among the very first, if not the first, to come back and bring the city back to life. Then we talked about some of the really hard knocks the city took after the floods, as if the flood itself wasn't enough, and how they you know, demonstrated resilience in that. Where do you want to go now? There's so many different uh, things we can talk about. The book is rich, of, full of stories and personalities, and, and I, I learned a lot from the things that I didn't know about the rebuilding. Well, I'd like to just, you know, put a little overview on it in the sense that uh, New Orleans, in the course of, uh, of something more than 250 years of existence, has been wiped out numerous times by floods fire several times. The city burnt to the ground and had to be rebuilt and uh, was depopulated by yellow fever. It has overcome uh, many obstacles and it seems that each time a different economic engine has driven the city's recovery. Un you know, unfortunately one of those was slavery. But, uh, you know, the oil industry and the shipping industry, the sugar uh, at different times were the economic engines. But uh, this time, I believe that culture is the economic engine that has driven the recovery. And Mitch Landrieu, who is the newly, well, elected mayor last year, as of last year, he is a great champion of Louisiana culture. He was the uh, lieutenant governor before... Uh, he was mayor, and, and culture was his big angle. And so he's he's really gone out of his way to try to help the musicians realize their goal. You know, in the immediate aftermath of the flood, the city officials got together, and they came up with a plan that was going to include all of this rebuilding, a vast green zone of country clubs and golf courses, a, a, a uh, museums and casinos, a kind of tourist Disneyland style tourist destination for rich people. Mm -hmm. And the, there was a great outcry against this. And ironically, probably the thing that did most to stop it was the recession, uh, because they were really on a fast track to make this happen. And we've seen in the destruction of a huge section of Central City for the new medical center, one of the illustrations of this plan, uh, you know, at the same time that Charity Hospital, which could have been reopened, was not allowed to reopen. But at any rate, the, the point is that uh, the musicians came back and restored the culture. They brought New Orleans back to a place where 
Music is a central part of everyday life. All right. This is Ken McCarthy uh, for John Swenson uh, saying uh, goodbye on behalf of Jazz on the Tube. Uh, Get yourself a copy of New Atlantis.